Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to conference. First, please join me in thanking our breakfast sponsor, IBS International Business Systems, for their support of this morning's program. I, uh, I have the great honor of introducing a true American hero. Like many of your companies, work sees the value for all of us when we pull together in various ways. Work is a founding member of Allen, the American Logistics Aid Network, and we have actively raised awareness in hiring this, the disabled in our industry. And this year, Work is proud to support Hiring Our Heroes initiative. Our speaker this morning and a special guest are active in these efforts and have amazing stories to tell. This video introduces Justin Constantine more forcefully than I ever could. My name is Justin Constantine. I grew up in Fairfax, Virginia. I joined the Marine Corps when I was in Colorado. I joined for a couple of reasons. A friend of my father's had been a Viet was a Vietnam vet. He really encouraged me to join the Marine Corps. And I felt like everyone owes a duty of service to our country. And for me, joining the Marine Corps was that duty. And I, I told him at the time, I said, when he joined the, the reserve, I said, Justin, there's a war going on there. And reserves get called up, you know. But he said, I'm OK with that, Dad. They were going to activate that particular reserve unit. And he didn't have to go along with it. He had the choice, but he decided he was going to go. I volunteered as a civil affairs team leader. And in that capacity, I led a small team of eight Marines. And our job in Iraq was to help rebuild the infrastructure that had been destroyed there. I deployed to Iraq in the, in the fall of 2006, late August. And that time in Iraq was a really volatile time for the Marine Corps, and we saw a lot of action. So the day of the injury, uh, he didn't ride in our vehicle. He took Sergeant Major Spot, which was in the vehicle behind us, and uh, we went to show a reporter, I believe it was at least one reporter, um, some, some of the infrastructure that we wanted to rebuild and the third post we stopped at um, vehicles are staggered about 50 to 100 meters apart I got out of the vehicle then uh, Major Constantine got out of the, the vehicle behind me and a minute maybe two minutes later and then I heard gunfire on October 18 2006 I was shot by an enemy sniper on, during one of our patrols the sniper shot me behind my left ear and a bullet exploded out of my mouth, causing catastrophic damage along the way. Uh, George Grant had never deployed before, and when he rolled me over, I was no longer breathing. I tried to feel for a pulse. I couldn't feel for a pulse. Um, I thought he was dead. Even though my face was in shreds, he performed rescue breathing and then cut out my throat and poured an emergency tracheotomy so I wouldn't drown my own blood. They say, sir, you've been shot. Um, I look him in the eye, he looks back at me. I can see he's, he's in pain, I can see he's scared, I can see he's hurting, and that's just from the one eye. The other eye is filled with blood. And when you see like, somebody hurting that much, and you kind of you, you care for them a little because you know you you've been with them for a certain amount of time, and even though it was short, it's still uh you still you feel it. <laughs> I I can't explain it, I guess. And um, I just feel so bad for him. And every time he tells me like thank you, or he tells he thinks he owes me something, I think about his eyes. I'm like, you don't owe me anything, man. I'm glad he survived. When I first arrived at the hospital, they had to sit me down and prepare me for the state Justin was in. Everything in his body at that point was completely bandaged, 
except for one eye and there was only one eye that hadn't suffered damage from the injury and I think as soon as I looked in his eye it was him although every other inch of him was completely covered up with bandages and hospital gowns that one eye looking into his eye I just knew everything would be okay and I knew there'd be a lot of challenges ahead obviously from his body he couldn't communicate we didn't know if he'd ever talk again at that point and for a couple months afterwards we didn't know if he would ever talk again but I knew that if we were there together, things would be okay. And so we were allowed to go in there. And my wife preceded me, and that was, I, I thought about this a lot. There was a moment there. What she did was she took in both her hands his hand and held it to her lips. Here it was, this mother holding or clasping the hand of her very seriously wounded warrior son. And that is a visage that will remain with me forever. The doctors told us if that bullet had been one half inch to the right, he would have been dead and we wouldn't be having this conversation. My first surgery I had was 19 hours long. And in fact, the doctors told Dahlia and my, my family if they waited 12 more hours to perform that surgery, my whole face would have collapsed because of the damage to the bones in my face and, and skull. Since then, I've probably had a couple dozen surgeries. The doctors have removed bones from my legs to reconstruct my upper and lower jaws. I've had a lot of facial reconstruction surgery. They've taken bones and bone marrow from my hip and other parts to use. And, and the doctors and nurses have been amazing throughout this whole time. Thank you. I really appreciate that. As part of Since his injuries, Justin is trying to be a positive influence on those around him. He was the honor graduate of his class at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College and is now pursuing an advanced law degree at Georgetown University. In 2010, the Secretary of Defense appointed Justin to a four-year congressionally mandated task force for recovering warriors. He also served as counsel for the Senate Committee on Veteran Affairs and as an operations attorney with the FBI Counterterrorism Unit. In 2011, Justin was recognized by the Wounded Warrior Project with their George C. Lang Award for Courage, and he is currently on their board of directors. He has been honored by the White House, the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Washington Redskins, and a number of universities. I've learned from Justin's experience that it's not always about getting to the finish line, but also the value of celebrating and embracing the small victories along the way. Whether it's life or business, the journey and what you learn as a consequence is often as important as the ultimate objective. It was all about resilience and hope and second acts in life and I think it was it was great for people to see how someone like Justin has overcome adversity and in his case very severe uh, adversity to do great things with his life and to serve other people. Everyone experiences challenges and obstacles in their life and certainly Justin has in his but the important thing is not whether adversity happens it's how you cope with it by staying true to your character in your personal life in your family life in your community. Justin is driven. Justin has a lot of goals and a lot of priorities and he's really motivated to accomplish a lot. And I think if anything that his injury has only pushed him farther to accomplish a lot and reach all those goals. Always look for the positive in life. No matter what life throws at you, good or bad, you can take it as an opportunity to grow and improve as a person. We should all seize those opportunities just as Justin has sharing his amazing story of recovery so that we can all learn from his journey. Thank you. You know, my mom would tell you to wait till I actually say something before you uh, give me any sort of applause. She's probably right. But I really appreciate the warm welcome and, and thank you, Michael. And in fact, Michael and I uh, had a chance to talk for a little bit uh, prior to this, I wanted to get to know a little bit more about work and the constituency. And he told me that a number of you are former military, served in the military. So I want to thank you and your families for your service and your sacrifice and all that you've done for our country. Michael, um, well, I already knew that 
everyone here is involved with warehouses to a certain degree. And I want to mention it when we were in Iraq, I lived in a warehouse. My team and I lived and lived and breathed and did everything in that warehouse. Uh, didn't run it nearly as well as I'm sure all of you do, and we probably could have used your expertise while we were there. Hopefully you're not living in your warehouses like we were uh, there and you actually get home and spend some time with your families. I also understand that a lot of you are managers and directors and VPs, and, and so I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about leadership because you all serve such important functions at your companies. But if it's true that with great power comes great responsibility, and all of you have that power to a certain degree, you have to ask yourselves, what are you doing every day with that great responsibility for your companies and your employees? And are you doing everything you can to be the best possible leader on a daily basis? Because you have to remember, it all starts with each one of you. So why am I up here in front of you today? Certainly, I can't teach you anything you don't already know about warehouse management or supply chain logistics. In fact, I can't see out of my left eye. And the, and the camera person already told me this, I can't only go this far, which is good, because I'm going to stay away from this corner, because that's bad news for me right there. Uh, you don't want to be driving anywhere near me uh, if you're in Virginia. But uh, I can't see on my left eye. I, uh, I'm missing most of my teeth and the end of my tongue. As I'm sure you can tell already, I can't see perfectly clearly. I also, as you heard in the video, the doctors took bones out of my legs to reconstruct my upper and lower jaw, so I really can't run anymore. I also suffer from post-traumatic stress and a traumatic brain injury. But you know what? I'm the luckiest person in this whole room. Because of the injury that caused these problems, I'm now far closer with my wife, Dahlia, than I ever would have imagined. I can now, and I feel like I'm stronger inside than I ever would have thought possible. And I can now put everyday problems in their proper perspective so I can focus on what's truly important to Dahlia and me. Winston Churchill once said, never, never, never give up. And I've tried to firmly embrace that philosophy during my recovery, and I think it applies to each one of you as well. None of you can ever give up on your employees. None of you can ever stop motivating them. And none of you can ever stop ensuring they understand your corporate vision, where you want to go, why they're important to you, and how they're a critical part of your company. Now, starting from my very first days at Officer Candidate School 17 years ago, the Marine Corps has pounded into my head over and over again a number of basic principles relating to the core concepts of taking the proper way of taking care of the people around you, the people who you are privileged to lead. Now, especially in today's business climate, where it's getting easier uh, for your high-performing employees to find other work opportunities, where constant communication means everyone knows what it's like in other offices, and a growing movement among employees where they're no longer simply motivated by money, taking care of your people has to be your number one priority. In any discussion about leadership, we have to start with a premise that it's not just effective management but that a great leader puts his or her employees' needs first and then empowers them to operate at their highest level. This, of course, will affect their loyalty to you, which will affect their customer service, and then that's where your profits start rolling in after that. And take a second to think about it. How many of your employees have the name of your company permanently branded on their skin? Probably none. Ho hopefully none, or else you have a a weird person on your staff there. <laughs> but if you roll up a Marine sleeve, chances are you're going to see USMC or Semper Fi or something else like that uh, on his or her arm or shoulder or back or wherever else. Imagine the dedication, the loyalty it must take to do that. That tattoo signifies pride, identity, and allegiance. It's really hard to recreate anywhere else. That's a, that's a big one. Maybe you'll get work across the back of a... The new president, yeah, that's what you have to do. That's your first, that's your first order of business. <laughs> but our motto is a big part of the leadership ethos of the Marine Corps. Semper Fi is known around the country 
and also people around the world are familiar with it as well. It means always faithful, and it reflects a mindset shared by all Marines. And think about how powerful those two words are. It doesn't mean sometimes faithful, or faithful when it's convenient, but it's a complete, it's a complete dedication to the, uh, to the mission. It's a complete commitment. It's a two-way street that runs up and down the entire length of the organization. For us, Semper Fi means being willing and prepared to put your life on the line for that Marine to your left or to your right. And I know a little bit about this. I joined the Marine Corps after my second year of law school and, and served as an attorney in the Marine Corps on active duty for six years. But when I volunteered for the deployment to Iraq, it wasn't in the role of a JAG officer. In the Marine Corps, all the officers learn the basics of many different positions, so I volunteered for the deployment as a civil affairs team leader. And as you saw in the video, in that capacity, I had the honor of leading a small team of eight Marines, and we, and we live in, in this warehouse. The warehouse is actually behind us. Now, I know you all have the same question that everyone has that I talk to. What is Brad Pitt doing there on the left-hand side of the, of the picture with Justin Squad? But although I've had 25 reconstructive surgeries, I'm on par with most of Hollywood. That is, actually isn't Brad Pitt, some other good-looking guy. But as a civil affairs team leader, I had the responsibility of developing contracts to the local Iraqi population to help rebuild the, the destroyed infrastructure. Unfortunately, the fall of 2006 was an extremely uh, kinetic time for the Marine Corps in Iraq, and, and the uncertainty was at its most powerful level. So convincing the local Iraqis to work with us was virtually impossible because they would be visited at night with very real death threats from that uncertainty. That being said, I'll always look back on my time in Iraq as a highlight of my career. Not many lawyers get the opportunity to lead Marines in a combat environment. I learned a lot about myself and effective leadership while I was there. Now, as Marines, we do many things very well. But one thing in particular is that we take care of each other. And I know that's important to everyone here as well. In fact, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the Marines around me on October 18, 2006, as well as an amazing Navy corpsman. And because I worked closely with a battalion commander, he put me on what he called his jump team, which was comprised of about a dozen of us who went out across the wire into, out into contested territory three or four or five times a week. So I went out with my team, and I also went out with the colonel on his missions. Often we went out to the forward operating bases so the colonel could check on his Marines there and make sure they were doing okay, make sure the morale was high, make sure they were getting the food they needed and they were accomplishing the mission. The same thing that, as managers and directors you do on a daily basis. This is a picture of one of our forward operating bases. As you can see, it's actually a house that we, we paid the family to move to another part of the neighborhood so we could use that. We up armored it with sandbags to protect against mortars and snipers. And we use this, these fobs in these neighborhoods, as launching pads for offensive operations and intel gathering operations, but also to let the local Iraqis know that, hey, we want to help protect you from these insurgents. We're going to live here amongst you. We want to be part of the solution. We're committed to helping you. So really, we could make that area safe and keep pushing forward towards Ramadi, which some of you have heard of, which was our main goal at the time. Uh, in fact, we were near this fob on the day I was shot. We got to an area where we knew an enemy sniper was operating because he had already killed a few of our Marines. But of course, that wasn't going to get in the way of our mission. We actually had a reporter with us that day, as George mentioned in the video. And he and others have reiterated to me what happened because I just don't remember most of that day. I know we stopped in the Iraqi police station early in the morning. It had been shot up the night before, and the colonel wanted to talk to the police chief about how to better defend the position. Then we stopped at another one of our files, a much smaller one. It wasn't very well protected. And I noticed that the reporter was kind of just standing around, not moving, like this, which is the last thing you want to do if you know there's a sniper in the area. You're supposed to keep moving at least a little bit. He and I were in the same vehicle, so we drove to the next fob, or the next area, and we got out of the Humvee and started walking away, and I said to him, hey, Jay, you have to move quicker here. Don't forget about that sniper. We don't want you to get injured. He told me that based on what I said to him, he took a big step forward, and a split second later, a bullet came in right between us and hit the wall, right where his head had been just before. 
Before I could react, the next round came in and hit me behind my ear and, and exploded out of my mouth, causing incredible damage, as you can imagine. In fact, the Marines around me thought I had been killed. And when the Navy corpsman came running over, they said, don't worry about the Major. He's dead. Well, George Grant is an amazing young man. Obviously, he didn't listen to them, I wouldn't be, or I wouldn't be here today. Even though blood was pouring out of my skull and what was left in my face, George was able to focus solely on me and keep me alive. I can't imagine what that must have looked like, but somehow he was able to perform rescue breathing on me, and then he also cut out my throat and conducted an emergency tracheotomy so I wouldn't drown my own blood. In the face of overwhelming adversity, with complete disregard for his own life, George was able to focus just on me. In fact, despite all that was going on around him, including that sniper who was still trying to shoot whoever he could, and this wasn't a clean, pristine hostile environment. This was, a, this was a battlefield. There was dirt and rocks and sand and stones everywhere. And George was wearing 65 pounds of protective armor like we all were that summer. And it was certainly over 100 degrees and he was sweating like crazy. Despite all that, George did such a perfect job in my tracheotomy that my plastic surgeon back in the States thought another surgeon had performed it. Now keep in mind that George had never performed this type of surgery on a human being before. He had done it once, nine months prior at Camp Palace in California in a controlled training environment for Corman, where he performed a tracheotomy on a pig. And I don't know what that says about me. I don't care what that says about me. The pig lived, I lived, so it's all good. You know, uh, I owe my life to George, and so obviously, I, whoops. This controller was supposed to be marine proof, so I wouldn't make any mistakes. I messed up. I had a picture um, of George, but you saw that in the video. You saw a couple of pictures of George. I'm a big fan of George, and you know he's a real hero to me. Now, when I was shot, the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel de Grossier, was faced with a tough decision, just like you guys are faced with tough decisions all the time as well. Should he call in a medical evacuation, but not really knowing how long it would take for the helicopter to get there because of competing interests all over the battlefield? Or should he risk one of the roadside bombs and have someone drive me to the aid station in an effort to stabilize me? Well, he picked Lance Corporal Jordan Bueller, a 21-year-old kid from New Orleans, to drive me to the aid station. And he told, me, told him to drive me as fast as possible. Now, as you know from the news coverage, as you know from the news coverage in Afghanistan, those improvised explosive devices are very powerful. They're very hard to detect, and they're, they're easy to put in place. Back in Iraq, then, we were faced with the same situation. We literally hit them every day, and we learned the hard way that if you drove faster than 15 miles per hour when you hit one, you dramatically increase the chances of causing your vehicle to flip end over end and potentially killing everyone inside that vehicle. But just like Corman Grant had done minutes earlier, Lance Corporal Bueller, who frankly I did not know very well at the time, put his own life on the line for me and drove me 70 miles an hour to get me to the aid station in what they call the golden hour, which is so critical after a traumatic injury. Now, I'll go ahead and put a picture of this graphic. You, you already saw it. You already saw it in the video. This is just to show you what George was dealing with at the time. But this is a week after. This is a week later. This is from the hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. What George was dealing with was certainly a lot worse, and it's just a testament to what he was able to accomplish. Here's the two of us together. On the, uh, the one on the left was early on. I obviously came back from the deployment much earlier than I anticipated. The, the infantry battalion came back to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, about four or five months later. When I heard they were coming back, Dolly and I got in our car from Virginia and drove down there to be there with them. And there were hundreds, of, hundreds of folks there. All the families from all the Marines were there, and the corpsmen, and people from the base. And it was kind of like a movie where the, you know, we had the tents and the bands and all that, and then you could see the Greyhound bus coming through the base. The Marines were hanging out the window. They may or may not have been drinking beer along the way, you know, one or two. But um, it was fantastic. And you can imagine who the first person I went up to and said, thank you. Thank you for saving my life. Obviously, it was George. You can see in the picture, well, okay, you can see in the picture that I still had the trait collar on. It was very, that it took a long time to recover. But you also see how tired George looks in that picture. He, you know, he'd been in Iraq for seven months. 
I wasn't the only Marine he saved. He saved a number of us. But there were a good handful who he was not able to save. And that weighed heavily on his mind and still does to this day. The next picture is from last year at a Wounded Warrior event we were at together down in Florida. And I like this because you can see how far we've both come along during our recoveries. And actually now I'm in a position where I can help George, so I really appreciate that. George is very humble. When I told him what the plastic surgeon said about doing a perfect job, he merely said, sir, I was just doing my job. I will never forget that. It resonated with me. I mean, what more could he have done? And, and he didn't think it was a big deal. He is a good reminder of us to always work hard, and we always can do better. Even George thinks he can do better, although I don't know what more he could have done. As I said, those roadside bombs were a big danger for us. This is a picture of one of our vehicles I took um, about a day or two after it was bombed, just to give you an idea of what Lance Corporal Jordan Bueller was facing that day. As I said, he didn't hesitate to drive me to the aid station. I'm sure that George Grant and Jordan Bueller didn't wake up on October 18 planning to save my life that day. They just reacted to the situation that unfolded in front of them based on their training and who they are at their core. Compassionate, selfless, faithful, and committed to the greater good. That's what Semper Fi is. Now, each one of you has any number of data clerks, first-line supervisors, and others just going about their day at work. And you have to ask yourselves, are they as committed to your companies and to the employees around them in the same way as Jordan Bueller and George Grant? Whatever the corporate equivalent is of leave no Marine behind, do they share that same, that same vision, those same feelings? Does your staff feel motivated to perform beyond expectations? Share your vision of where your team needs to go and feel that leadership opportunities exist for them, whatever their position is. If the answer to any of those is no, then I suggest that's the place where you focus on and try to institute some change there. In the Marine Corps, we have a group of core concepts that we really focus on when it comes to leadership. And I think one that most applies to you in creating a great environment for your leadership and your staff can be summed up in three words. Officers eat last. Marine leaders prioritize the accomplishment of the mission first, the welfare of the Marines second, and their own personal needs third. When meals are served, the lowest ranking enlisted members eat first and the most senior officers eat last. And that way, each level of Marine ensures that those junior to him or her eat before they do. Now, why would we do that? When Marines see their leaders put their units' needs before their own, they feel compelled to do the same for others around them. And perhaps more importantly, a leader's ability to show his Marines through actions, not words, that he truly cares for them, fosters fierce loyalty and an unwavering willingness to follow. Now in Iraq, and this is just a very small example, when we were going to go out on a long patrol, and I knew about the patrols because I'm the battalion staff, I would get up a little bit early to, in the morning, maybe 05 or 5.30, go over behind the chow hall and get a cooler full of ice and, and somehow come and gear a bunch of Gatorades. But those drinks were from my Marines. And if anything was left over, then I would get that. But my Marines knew that, and I never went thirsty a single day while I was in Iraq. And I can still remember our platoon sergeant from Officer Canada School, which is probably equivalent for you of a mid-level manager, telling me that I would never be as close to my troops as he was because he came from where they did and they had this bond that we didn't. But that didn't mean my responsibility towards them was minimized in any way. And he was right. By the time we got to Iraq, I learned every last detail I could about my Marines where they were from, why they joined the Marine Corps, what they want to do after the deployment, what they're good at, what they don't like doing, their brothers and sisters, politics, religion, you name it. I, wanted my Marine, I knew I was going to have to trust them with my life. I wanted them to know that my only two criteria, my focus points, were mission accomplishment and their welfare. Leading by example is a core component of that mindset of taking care of your people. It should be obvious to you that no one will want to follow you if they don't feel like you're willing to do what you're asking them as well. 
Now, I made it a priority in Iraq to leave my team on every night mission, on every patrol, and even in our training regiment leading up to the deployment. I often worked shoulder to shoulder with my Marines, even if the task was something as mundane as cleaning out a warehouse. But I would never ask them to do something that I myself wasn't willing to do or, or had already done on a previous occasion. And the same is true in your operating spaces. You can't expect your supervisors to really properly learn all they need you about your staff and be a true resource to them if you yourselves aren't willing to go out and practice management by walking around and showing your interest in your people. If you're not willing to go out there and talk to them, why should anyone else do the same thing? As I said, I often work side by side with my Marines. Here's a picture of me with Sergeant Howard, who really became my right-hand man there. I, I could you know, feel very comfortable leaving for a day or two to go on a separate mission with the colonel, knowing that Sergeant Howard was going to make sure that everything happened just the right way. We learned a lot about each other while we were there, and I learned I could trust him implicitly. We learned, as I said earlier, we view lead Marines as a privilege, not a right. And that has to be earned every day. And really, the same is true in each one of your spaces as well. Now, I know I'll never be the same Marine that I was, that my career as a trial attorney is over, and that I'll always have problems with eating and drinking and concentrating and remembering things for the rest of my life. But I really enjoy what I do for a living, and I know that my mentors have my back. I'm excited to work on speeches like this every day, to share what I've learned about overcoming adversity and being a positive influence in the lives of those around me. Now imagine if each one of your employees felt the same way. Well, they can, and it all starts with each one of you. As a role model, you set the tone every day, and you can, ex you can inspire superior levels of achievement by showing your own superior levels of effort on a daily basis. Officers eat last, and so should you. Now, over the last seven years, I've learned a number of important lessons that have helped me cope with a truly life-altering situation. And I know that what I went through is on the extreme end of the spectrum, but what I've learned isn't. Just as I face challenges in my personal and professional lives, I imagine many of you here have as well. Uh, we, we don't have too much time, so I'm only going to go into one of those lessons and spend a little bit of time with that or on that with you. And that is... Teamwork is critical for success, for you and for others around you. Obviously, in your business, you know all about teamwork. You're a critical part of teamwork in the process. But I think sometimes we can forget just how important this concept really is. Whether you're playing on a sports team, patrolling with a squad of Marines, or working with those around you on, the, on this next big contract that you just got, you simply can't get it done all by yourselves. And they say a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So if you aren't pulling your weight, and if you aren't really striving for your team success, you have to ask yourself, are you really practicing good teamwork? This is a picture of our battalion commander, Colonel DeGrosse. When we got to Iraq, we were faced with a tough situation, as, as you have heard. We couldn't tell who the insurgents were from the local Iraqis. Also, it was normal and legal for the Iraqis to carry a lot of heavy weaponry around with them all over the place. So that was very challenging for us. So Colonel DeGrosse actually confiscated all the weapons here in this town until he determined that it was safe. Once he realized it was safe and we could keep moving, moving west, he wanted to give those weapons back. But he didn't give them back to individuals. He worked with these gentlemen here. They're called imams, and they're very important people. They're the local religious leaders, and they're like our mayor, but more so. Colonel Grosse wanted to create an allegiance with these imams, and he knew one way was through the weapons, because he would empower them in the eyes of the, of the locals by letting them decide who in the villages got these weapons back. So I watched how Colonel Grosse created a team with them, an important team, because it was all about our safety and mission accomplishment. And this was hard work, because they spoke Arabic, we spoke English, we had translators, sure, but a, loss, a lot gets lost in translation. And let's face it, the Iraqis had one agenda, and often we had a separate one, for better or worse. And so it was a tough environment. But I watched on the sidelines Colonel Grosier created those bonds and built his team. 
Now, when I got to the Naval Hospital of Bethesda, my life was turned upside down and inside out. But the one person who held it all together for me was Dahlia. Back in 2006, however, Dahlia and I weren't married. We didn't get married until 2008, and just last year we had our five-year wedding anniversary. What kind of husband would I be if I mentioned our wedding and don't show you at least one good picture of that, right? So here's a, here's a picture from that wonderful day. We had met earlier in the year in 2006 in a Spanish immersion program in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dahlia was there from California, and I was there from Virginia. I was only there for three weeks. We were in the same small class. It was just four of us, actually three women and me, so it was a really hard, uh, hard environment. I, I persevered. It's okay. Uh, but Dahlia and I hit it off right away. We spent a lot of time there together and then dated that summer back in the States. When I deployed to Iraq in the fall, Dahlia actually left to pursue a PhD at Cambridge University in England. Unlike other wars, though, we were able to keep in touch almost every day through email and letters and care packages and the occasional satellite phone call. That was an important part of, of my recovery, was having those communications beforehand because we had a solid base to, to grow off of. When I was initially airlifted out of Iraq, they took me to the military hospital in Landstuhl, Germany. Some of you are familiar with that. And typically, service members don't get personal visits when they're in line school, unless it's a worst case scenario, because it's so far from the States. But Dahlia was already in England, so she was able to get there pretty easily. And we were there for four days together, and then the doctors decided it was time to send me on to the Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. At that point, Dahlia decided to leave her doctoral program and come be with me in the hospital. Never mind that going to Cambridge was a lifelong dream of hers. And never mind that she's in California and certainly didn't know anyone uh, near Bethesda. And keep in mind that at that point, the doctors still weren't even sure if I was going to survive what happened to me. But when I woke up from my coma, Dahlia was there next to me, and together we have unconsciously practiced all the good attributes of teamwork to really make it to a tough day and a tough recovery to where we are today. This is a picture from my Purple Heart ceremony, and typically a general or some other officer will come in and just pin it on your chest when you're in a hospital or in a small ceremony. Well, I thought it was entirely appropriate to have Dolly up there next to me when that happened, because at that point it had really become our injury and our recovery, and I wanted everyone there to know that. The early reports about my injury were that I had been killed in action, and as I mentioned in the video, when Corman Grant rolled me over, I was no longer breathing. So I know that life can be difficult and full of challenges. But take it from me, life is also precious and sweet, something we should treasure, not just get through. Life should be about celebration, not just survival. So you need to turn life's challenges around and fight through them, like I did. I'm nobody special, and each of you can do the same thing with, what, with whatever comes up in front of you. Over the last seven years, I've tried to lead from the front and serve as a role model in my Wounded Warrior community. That way, I know I'm pushing myself in the right direction, and I'm also motivating others around me. And I imagine each one of your communities, both at work and at home, there are plenty of opportunities for you to lead from the front also. The bottom line is, life changes, for better or worse. It all depends how you look at it. I choose a glassy half full, not half empty, and to embrace change. I want to live life from the future, not the past. I've learned through courage, really um, not just moral courage, but really inner strength, um, a humble manner, and a victorious spirit where each capable of overcoming the toughest obstacles. Two years ago, with my speech impediment and traumatic brain injury, I never would have imagined being up here in a room this large. So just imagine what each one of you and your teams back in the offices can do when you really put your mind to it. Now, let's take everything we, we've just discussed about taking care of those around you if you want them to take care of you and add another quick dimension to it. I want to talk to you... Uh, quickly about veteran hiring. You're going to hear from the colonel after me. As some of you are aware, there's a veteran hiring fair going on next door, so I just want to briefly touch on that. We all know that today's veterans are coming out of the military with a huge array of skills and abilities. 
many of them have worked in, in the tech industry in their, while in the military. A lot of them have worked in logistics, and virtually everyone has served in some sort of leadership capacity. They believe in the value of teamwork. They've also been pre prepared and trained to take the initiative when it's appropriate, and they've been entrusted to make critical decisions in the blink of an eye. All have been important part of teams that had to work long hours to accomplish a mission and meet hard deadlines. These veterans today will show up for work on time, do what you tell them, take the initiative if it's appropriate, and keep working and working and working until the job is done. But don't just take my word for it. A couple months ago, the first lady was talking to a group of construction companies that had committed, to, uh, they had just rolled out their veterans hiring initiative. They had committed to hiring 100,000 veterans in the next 10 years. And this is what she told them. You've done this because you know it's a smart thing to do for your businesses. Because you know that America's military turns out some of the highest skilled, hardest working employees this country has ever seen. And I couldn't agree with her more. She's exactly right. I could go on and on, but I want to make sure that uh, I don't put you to sleep. I'm, you just had a nice meal, and I know it's right here in your stomach. I'm afraid uh, I may be losing some of you. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for inviting me to part of your conference. I know a lot of your work uh, can be pretty stressful. I want to emphasize how important it is to keep a good sense of humor. You have to laugh at things or it'll drive you crazy. As an example, uh, keep in mind, I, I did not deploy as a, as a JAG. I deployed, I deployed civil affairs with an infantry unit. But very early on in my recovery at the hospital, my dad came in and said, see, Justin, even in Iraq, they know who the lawyers are. So, you know, thanks, Dad. Uh, I appreciate the support. But thank you very much for all you're doing, and I really appreciate you inviting me to your conference. Thank you. <laughs>